since I'm the last speaker here today, I'll try and keep it as quick as possible. Can everybody hear me up the back? Yeah. Okay. Um, I am going to talk about uh, automated uh, testing, and I am going to talk about it in the context of IOR because we work very closely with uh, development groups who are developing on IOR. Um, when we're talking about automated testing, a lot of people tend to focus immediately on the bugs, what kind of bugs we can find. Um, of course, that's important, but it's, it's only half the story. So before I start running some simple demonstrations and showing you what type of testing we can do, uh, I'd like to talk in a, a general way about the benefits of using software uh, automation. So I'll begin with a little scenario. Consider the case where we have a development team who's prepared their software. Okay, so they've been working very hard for weeks or months, and now that the software is available, and either they're passing it to maybe the hardware team who's waiting on it, or a validation team, or uh, maybe even directly to the customer. So sure enough, as life follows day, uh, there's a problem. So either the validation team finds some problem, or worse again, your customer finds some problem. So they've deployed the software on the device, and the device crashes, or the application breaks down in some sort of way. So whereas we thought the project was almost complete, we're now back fighting fires. So when we have that uh, case where a bug has been found at a late stage, I think these are typically the steps that developers would go through at their desk. Okay, so we're talking about the practical steps that the developer would follow in trying to fix this issue. And this is my estimate of the, the weight of each of these steps in terms of how much time and effort we need to put in to, uh, to carrying out these tasks. Now, from my experience as a better developer some years ago, most of my effort was spent on reproducing the issue. Uh, if I'm lucky, sometimes you know, you'll receive that the user might give you some general information about how the device was running when the crash occurred. So from there, you're trying to figure out how to reproduce the issue. Then you want to find a fix. You want to make sure that fix doesn't introduce more defects. And then you have to retest everything. Okay. So the point I'm trying to emphasize here is the impact on the project schedule, the project resources, when you have these types of quality issues. Uh, I'm being a little bit facetious with the money bags here, but again, the point is the amount of time, the amount of money that is spent in your projects on uh, addressing these types of issues. And that's emphasized even more here when we look at the point here that most of the defects are introduced at the very earliest stages of the project when we're coding. However, majority of them are actually found at the very latest stage okay, when it comes to the, the testing. This is typically because most groups leave the testing until the very end of the project. And uh, as we know, the longer or the, the later that you find these problems, the more expensive it is to fix them. Simply because the size of the application is so big, the amount of retesting you have to do, the care that you have to do in making sure there's no new bugs introduced. So going back to our, our little scenario, this team has, had, uh, has encountered this problem. So let's say the department head has decided we can't go through this anymore. We can't afford to go through this. We have spent more money than we had planned on this project. We have gone over schedule. Our customer is not happy. Uh, maybe our competitor almost got in there and uh, took this project from us. So we need to address this and make sure it doesn't happen again. So you might do some sort of a, a, a root cause analysis to understand what was the problem in the software that caused this, this issue. So just a simple example, maybe you can uh, reduce it to some case like this, where you have maybe one developer is responsible for writing a function that allocates some resource, just as an example. And the way they designed it is that when you're trying to allocate the memory in this case, it's not the call function, but the caller function that's responsible for checking if the pointer is null. Okay? Uh, but then another developer, because just a simple miscommunication in the team, another developer decided I'm going to use this function, but I assume that the null checking is going to be done by the call function, not the caller. So just a very simple mistake between the team, and it's caused this problem. So how do we fix this? I mean, it's easy to fix it in this instance, but how do we fix this in the project to make sure this never occurs again in the next project or in another team in the, in the group? Well, there's some traditional ways that we, uh, we can use. One is the, the peer review. So, I'm not sure how many of you have, have done or are doing peer reviews. It's generally recognized as one of the best ways of uh, uncovering a lot of different types of defects. So this is where you sit down at a table, 
perhaps particularly for junior uh, developers that are coming into your team, that you sit down with senior developers and they go through your code. Now obviously for that to be accurate, it means you've got to go through line by line, you need to manually scan through the execution paths while you're sitting there, so that's, that can be difficult. Um, another approach is testing, so we can just test as much as possible, write as many test cases as possible, try and cover as many scenarios in the code to catch these problems before they get to our customers. So these are some of the strategies you can use, but there are downsides to these as well. For the peer review, for example, it takes a lot of time to sit down, to schedule a meeting, to go through the code. Um, all This is an additional task. So it's an additional task your developers have to do. So maybe they have, whereas before they had five days for developing code, now they have three and a half for developing code, a day and a half for code review, something like this. So it impacts on the productivity of the engineer. Your, your developers aren't productive unless they're adding some value to the, the software that you're, you're preparing, to what you're selling effectively. So if they're implementing some software that's adding new features or optimizing the code to be more competitive, then they're being productive. A developer is not being productive sitting in a room doing a uh, code review. Likewise for test casing, uh, for tests, <coughs> they, for the exact same reason. How much time am I going to spend writing tests? I'm now writing, or spending three days writing the code that we're getting paid for, and two days writing test cases. So for the exact same reason, it impacts on the productivity. So we now have, as a project manager, you're stuck in this scenario. We have quality issues that are impacting on the project schedules and the budgets, and the ways we try and address that are also impacting on the productivity, which again <coughs> impacts on schedules and budgets. So how do we solve this problem? This leads me very neatly to the topic of this presentation, which is automation. This is exactly what automation is for. It's to address both of these issues. It's not just about finding bugs. It's not just about quality. We can achieve quality by doubling the amount of time or the amount of developers you spend or you have on your projects. So the whole goal of automation in software development and software testing is to allow you to achieve your quality goals by very effectively finding and preventing bugs in the software, but doing it in a way that's not impacting on the productivity of your developers by removing a lot of the manual work from these types of tasks. And that's exactly what we do with PowerSoft. So just, just very, very briefly, for the last 25 years, uh, this is what we, the industry were working in. We developed software automation, automation tools which implement these types of testing practices, whether it's coding standards, uh, unit testing, code review. Uh, we have headquarters around the world, throughout Asia, uh, the US and Europe, and we work very closely with our uh, customers and our partners here in Israel. In terms of the solutions we have, without a doubt we have the broadest range of solutions in the business. Uh, from our embedded solutions to our application development uh, in Java or .NET, uh, web service uh, testing, project management, virtualization. So we have a very broad range of skills and experience in, in this area and uh, it's well recognized that we're leaders uh, in this, uh, this business. Okay, so what I want to demonstrate today is one of our solutions, which is the embedded uh, solution called C++ Test, which works with the IAR embedded uh, workbench. Uh, I'm particularly happy to be here because um, we're definitely seeing a demand in the requests on our side to support different IAR platforms. Just this week, uh, we added support for the IAR workbench 6.1, which again, is, we're getting a lot of demand for. So the C++ Test, uh, it, uh, it automates a broad range of practices, so we don't just focus on one type of testing. There's a number of different types of testing possible, and there's five bundled into to one solution. So we have coding standards enforcement, which is a type of static analysis, not to be mistaken or confused with flow analysis, which is the other type of static analysis which a lot of you might be familiar with. This is where you're scanning for things like memory leaks, buffer overflows, you might get uh, false positives, false negatives, things like that. The static analysis uh, pattern matching is something different. That's the coding standards enforcement. We automate the peer review process. We can automatically generate test cases. And we also do runtime application monitoring. And, uh, and uh, code coverage? Code coverage is a byproduct of the unit testing and the application monitoring. Okay. Okay. So this all is what I'll try to demonstrate. All that is being done by analyzing the source code? It's all source code analysis, that's correct. So it's divided into two. We have static analysis, so it kind of aligns back with what I was talking about here with the, 
the different types of testing that you would otherwise do manually. So code reviews, you're still uh, typically looking at, are we following certain patterns when we're writing the code? Okay, are we adhering to MISRA or JSF or some of these coding practices? And whereas the testing then is more involved with dynamic testing, unit testing, running the application, doing your debugging, etc. Okay. So here I have a simple, very simple little IOR uh, uh, project. It's an embedded sensor project, which uh, it's an application uh, project which runs on a, an ARM target board. The sensor is reading some environment uh, variables and then it's displaying some values on the LCD on the, on the device. So before I start deploying it on the target, I want to run it on the, the uh, C-SPY simulator. Can everybody see that relatively clearly? Okay, when I run this, what I'm expecting to see so this is simulating the LCD on my, uh, my device. Oh, I'm expecting to see some sensor values being printed. So I run it, and sure enough, it's blank. So from here, what's our decision? Well, we can go and again, we can review the code, we can get out our debugger. If we're lucky, we can simulate the problem on the simulator. Otherwise, we're moving to our hardware debugger. Another option is to use an automated solution. So I have imported the project into our C++ test solution. So these are some of the embedded development uh, platforms we support, including IAR. So I import the, um, the project and I start running one type of testing. So I start with the coding standard. This is where we have identified from previous projects the type of mistakes developers continue to make when they're writing the code. This is not bug detection. What we're looking at is we have defined a policy that people should follow when they're writing the code. If they follow that, they're more inclined to avoid bugs. Okay, so I want to see as a baseline, has all the developers followed my recommended coding standards? So this is the source code analysis. We're running through each and every line of code, whether, it, whether it's a thousand lines, 40 million lines of code, and it checks each and every line. So in this case, it scanned through the code and it found a violation of the policy. It's not a bug. It's a violation of the coding policy. So looking at the result here, for those who can't see, it says the rule that's being implemented is assignment operators shall not be used in expressions that yield a Boolean value. I made this mistake all the time. You're doing if A equals B, and instead of a comparison, you do an assignment, and things go crazy. So I click on this, and indeed, that's exactly the mistake I've made here. So instead of checking for the status of the, the uh, sensor, I've assigned it to always be stopped, and that's why my, uh, my LCD was blank. So I fixed that. I can go back to IOR because they're synced. And then let's rerun. OK, so now running it, hopefully we'll see something in the output. We do, which is good, but uh, I've got a lot of rubbish here in the output. So I fixed one problem, but I've still got some problems in this code. So these developers are probably fired. So again, what do we do next? We still have problems. Well, we can go back and try another strategy. So what we're trying to do here is we're peeling away different layers of bugs in this application. So this time I'll try dynamic analysis. I'm going to try and run this application and as it's running, in the background, the C++ test is scanning the memory accesses to see if it can find any runtime issues. So now you are using the simulator of the processor? We've integrated with the C spy. Mm -hmm. So if I want to run it, we're running it effectively with C spy. Okay. So I'm running the application with memory monitoring. So it takes the application, it builds it, but it instruments it. Now we don't touch, I had a question earlier on, what are you doing to my source code? We don't touch the source code. We take the code, make a copy of it, we instrument it, and we execute it. Okay, so your source code remains intact. But you, you do not have the IO stimula stimulation. I mean, the, the IO is static with that simulator. Well, no, if you have runtime IO, you can, yeah, can simulate. I mean, in this example, no. <coughs> okay, so again, I've run it, and again, it's reported me a task. And you can see that somebody asked about coverage. You can see the coverage is being reported here. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So we look at the latest issue. 
So it's a runtime error detection. It says, do not access memories using out of range pointer. If we expand, we see the stack trace. In the stack trace, it tells me exactly what the valid range for this particular array is and what the index was when this crash occurred and when this problem occurred. So it's telling me the valid range for the array is 0 to 2, and the index was minus 1 when this problem occurred. So we get the stack trace. Again, you can see what I'm trying to emphasize here, it's not all about finding bugs, it's about the amount of time this saves you in your project if you had to do this manually. If you had to get out your debugger, step through all the different execution paths, try and figure out what the problem or where the root cause of the problem is. So by using the stack trace, I can click through to try and understand where the problem is, where the origin, the cause of the problem is. So this is highlighting for me, this is the, in the, the array we're talking about. So the index is here, which was passed to this function, which came from here. So I can see, as the developer of this code, I can see that somewhere between here and here, there was a problem. We initialize it to minus one. I'm not going to get into too much detail. Uh, I know the problem is here. Okay, so the developer made some mistake. But sorry. Yes. Lots of uh, uh, conditions are not... Uh Lots of uh, uh, real conditions will not be met if, uh, if there is no uh, stimuli, stimulus from the hardware. Uh, let me explain to you. הוא מריץ את זה על הסימולטור רק מטעמי נוחות, אין שום בעיה להריץ את זה על הטארגט, רק בהדגמה שלא נצטרך פה לפרוס חומרה במעבר בין בן אדם לבן אדם, אז משתמשים בסימולטור. כל מה שאנחנו מראים לך פה אפשר היה להראות על החומרה. זה רץ על החומרה, מטעמי נוחות של הקוצר זמן של ההרצאה זה אנחנו משתמשים בסימולטור. אבל בדרך כלל בודקים את זה על הטארגט וזה רץ על הטארגט כמו באופן רגיל. שהניתוח סטטי זה ללא שינוי, אבל שניתוח דינמי הוא לא עושה קופי במקום אחר, הוא עובר אינסטרומנטציה. כדי שאפשר יהיה לקבל coverage ולראות איפה עברנו, צריכים uh, להכניס טאגים מסוימים לקוד. זה מאוד מינימלי, ועושים את זה בשיטה של יוניט טסטינג על פייל פייל, לא עושים את זה על כל הפרויקט במקביל. אפשר לעשות את זה על כל הפרויקט, אבל עושים את זה בדרך כלל. בשיטה של יוני טסטינג על כמה קבצים, אז ההשפעה היא מינימלית. רגע, אז למעשה התהליכים הם שאני לוקח את הקוד ומקמפל אותו, לא מקמפל אותו, מעביר אותו איזושהי טרנספורמציה של הקוד, ואחרי זה מקמפל אותו. כן. ואז... כן. אין דרך אחרת חוץ מאינסטרומנטציה לבדוק ולשדר החוצה מה שרץ על הטארגט. Dynamic testing can be done on a simulator, but also on a, the hardware device. I should have mentioned that. Okay. So this is the second type of validation technique in C++ test. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, you're peeling away basically different types or different classes of bugs in the code. All right. So let's go back and actually run this again just to make sure the application is in better state. Okay, and now I'm running it and it's, it's giving me what I'm expecting. Having said that, now I'm a bit nervous. I've found some bugs in this code and I'm not all that confident in the developer. So I'm going to run a couple of other tests just to confirm. So we go back again and this time I'm going to run another type of static analysis which is called flow analysis. Now where's the pattern matching, which is another type, the first type of static analysis, looks at just line by line how are developers writing code and are they following the policy. The flow analysis is a little bit more intelligent in that it's looking at potential execution paths in the code and if, there, um, if these execution paths are hit, will it result in a potential bug like a memory leak, buffer overflow, etc. Uh, there are limitations with the flow analysis and this is exactly why we package these as, as a bundle, that you're not just relying on one type of validation technique. If you do, it will be very effective at what it does but it will not cover every class of bug that you're going to hit. So something that you'll find with flow analysis, or that you'll miss with flow analysis, you'll find with unit testing. Something that you'll miss with unit testing, you'll find with coding standards. So this is the way it works. Okay, so I'm going to run the flow analysis, which is the third type of uh, testing in C++ test. 
So here we're scanning execution paths. I'm not executing. It's not on the target. It's not on the simulator. It's a source code analysis again. So it's scanning and it's reporting some potential bugs that's found in the code. Okay, so no point of dereferencing here. Uh, another out of bounds array here. Okay, so again, different type of bug that can be found. With the application monitoring, I think it was a little bit relevant to the point you made. You actually have to hit the, the bug. You have to reproduce the bug in order to get it. With the flow analysis, because we're not executing, it's just effectively, it's not a simulator, but it's effectively simulating potential execution paths. So it means, again, if you were to do this manually, you're going to have to try and you know, manually scan through the code and understand how the code is executing. So the main value of this is not just the bugs it can find, it's the amount of time this alleviates from developers. Okay, it frees up developers' time to do something more interesting uh, than you know, looking for a no point of dereferencing. Okay, final point on this, so the final type of testing was unit testing. So if I run again, and this brings me on to coverage, if we run again the memory monitoring just to see what part of the code has been tested with the normal application run. So it's going to run, and this time I'm going to include the coverage information. Now the coverage information can be a lot of different types. So a lot of people, line coverage is sufficient, others are interested in PATH, uh, a few are interested in MCDC. But we can look at the coverage and see exactly which parts of the code have been tested up to now. Okay, I'm already very suspicious about this project, so now I'm adamant that I want to make sure most of the code has been tested in some form. So we get a breakdown here of the line coverage. Again, we also support these different types of coverage, MCDC, if it's of interest. But I can see straight away there's one method here, one function that hasn't been tested at all. Now again, this is a demo project, it's very simple, but this is an error handling routine. And they're relatively difficult to simulate a scenario, either on the device or the simulator or other way, to make the code or make the execution enter the error handling routine. You almost have to break the device in order to hit this part of the code. Okay, So it can be difficult as a developer to test this code. So what I can do here is I'll generate a test case that will test this routine for me. Okay, As a developer, I've written this error handling routine. I want to make sure when I integrate it, I check it into the source control. I want to make sure it works. So I'll start by, I'll do this in two steps. I select the file and I'll generate the test framework. So I have worked in teams where I have had to manually write test cases, which means I've had to create a separate build configuration in order to run the test, which is separate from my, my release configuration. I've had to write the framework, the test cases. This is really time consuming. And as I said at the beginning, it's all about quality and productivity. So I'll run the uh, configuration, and it will generate the test framework for me. Okay, so this gives me nothing that I can use right now, but it's just alleviated a couple of hours of work for me. This is the test framework, it's got nothing at the moment. And now to this, I'm going to add a test case that will test this error handling routine. So there's a number of ways I can do this. I can, if I want to do real specific functional tests, I can manually add the test case. I can go in, we provide the source code, so you can manually add and customize it to get whatever type of testing you're looking for, but uh, I'll use the simple, easy way. Test case using wizard. So it, uh, it detects all the functions in this file, so I'm going to generate a test case for this function. I can specify here, if I want to, again, customize it, I can specify the inputs to the, the function and the expected output. So by specifying the expected output, I can do functional testing because they, it will report if the output is as I expect. If it's not as I expect, it's a functional error, essentially. I'll leave it for now, I'll just click finish, and all of the source code again is generated for the test. Finally, I'm going to run the test. Again, in this case on the simulator, I can run it on the target also. So again, here we're building a test executable, which includes the code under test, the test
test case, the framework, the information, the runtime library from C++ test that's responsible for monitoring the results, uh, capturing the coverage information, etc. Okay, and then I get, you can see the coverage, this has now been covered, it's been tested to some extent. Okay, so these are some of the different types of automation technologies <coughs> available with, uh, with this solution. It works nicely, I think, with the IAR. I like the way it syncs so that I don't have to you know, modify the code in two different IDEs. Um, again, just to come back as a summary to the main point, which was about productivity and quality. So again, when you're looking at these solutions, my advice is not just to focus on bugs. In fact, the Parasoft, what we recommend from our experience is not to focus on bugs at all, but to focus on productivity. If you focus on how you can make your engineers more productive, as a consequence to that, the quality of your code will improve, as well as you'll actually be in a position to achieve your, your uh, project schedules and budgets. Now the final point I want to make before I finish up, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. I'm speaking at a higher speed, which is usually you know, by five. But as a final point, a lot of people, I think, again, from my experience, when we're talking about automation, it's very easy to talk about it in a theoretical way. You know, this is the benefit. If you use this, you're going to see this benefits overnight. That's not really the case. But there are very practical, these are practical steps that you can introduce in software development, particularly in embedded development, that can have very practical and tangible benefits. Now, as some sort of proof of that, all of our development engineers in Parasoft, we use these tools ourselves. And in a, last year, in a, an audit of Parasoft by an independent uh, cons uh, consultant group, the Parasoft development staff were found to be eight to 15 times more productive than the industry standard. So we stand by what we say, and we use these products ourselves. They're designed by engineers for engineers. So it's because of this that for the last 25 years, we've been able to deliver cost-effective solutions and stay at the top of our game. And we're very eager to share that experience and our knowledge with anybody who's interested. Okay? If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Uh, are you checking uh, the code for coding groups? Say that again, please. For coding rules, are you checking? Coding rules? Yes. That was the, uh, the coding standards that I mentioned. Now, we have built in. I know I, I also have some misery rules. Mm -hmm. um, Built into the C++ test, again, most of the rules have some sort of an industry standard or some sort of industry specification background, like JSF, NISRA. But it's also all of these rules are gathered over the last 25 years of working with different development teams. And what teams are telling us are the most constant problems that keep coming up and how to uh, identify or fix those with coding standards. So built in at the moment, we have over 1,400 coding rules. Now, don't please, if you try no, this, don't For example, passing for, to pass FDA, for example. Sorry, say that again? To pass FDA, for example. To pass every day? Yeah. FDA. 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 The FDA. FDA. Oh, FDA, excuse me. Um, yes, we do have, you can see we have configurations there for FDA. Now, having said that, FDA, they don't have any specific coding guidelines. What they do have is, the, the spirit of the FDA is a process improvement that you implement a process and you show it's... Okay, but there are some common things in, in this thing. Sorry. There are some common things in there this are, coding there are process. There's some common things, some general yes. things, and we implement it this way. We have a phased approach that's recommended for showing a process improvement with the, mm -hmm. under the FDA guidelines. But there are, I, I, I know of no specific coding standard with, with FDA. Well, the FDA itself has um, bought this, the tool. That's right. So uh, sorry, I just wanted to make that point, but a lot of people have is seen it, they name all 1,400 rules and run it on their code of a million lines and then call me in the middle of the night screaming. Uh, this is a menu from which you select the rules that make the most sense for your team. Again, the mistake a lot of people also make is thinking that these, there's false positives and false negatives with these. Not with this. That's with the flow analysis. This is not about finding bugs. This is about deciding on a pattern that we're going to follow that will avoid the mistakes. So even if you get a violation report saying you've broken the policy, it's not saying there's a bug there, but it's saying you're writing the code in a way that it's more prone to bugs. So you want to avoid that. Okay, it's a subtle difference, but it's a very important one <coughs> between these two. Any other questions? Uh, it's okay to run uh, 
to run it on uh, C, a regular C code, or just on C++? Uh, C and C++. The little project I've been working on throughout this has been a C project. Okay. Yeah, so it's C and C++. I, the name of it, the product is C++ test, but it's for C and C++ coding. Okay. Okay. And the features are the exact same. Oh. How much? I'm a lowly technical <laughs> guy talking to this guy over here. Okay. Yes? Is there any uh, command line uh, version of uh, this product that I can uh, use it into the verification uh, website? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I, I should have mentioned about how, how, how it comes. So it's, we, it comes as a plugin at the moment for Eclipse and Visual Studio, and we have a standalone version based on Eclipse. We also have a uh, server edition, which is command line based. So for example, <clears throat> for the static analysis, for example, the coding standard, we recommend that developers run these on their code before they check it into source control. But you also have a safety net as a project manager to run these tests overnight. So the typical setup is you run it overnight, we generate the reports, we integrate with the source control system so we know which developer is responsible for the compilation. That's not always a good thing for developers. I was in one meeting where they wanted to tie it with the bonus scheme in the company and I was the most unpopular person in the building. Um, but you can use the command line edition to, to run it all, uh, automatically, generate the reports, email the reports to the developers to say, today this is what you need to fix. Likewise for the unit testing, flow analysis, etc. Any other questions? Yes. Sorry, I, I can't hear. In which language I should verify the Unicode the test uh, test uh, scenario? In which uh, language? Which language? Uh, you, you can do both. I mean, what, what I do is if, I'm, if my code is in C, my test cases are in C. Oh. If my code is in C++, my test cases. You have the option uh, to do both. When I generated the tests, there's an option comes up. Do you want the test cases, the test suites, the framework to be in C or C++? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for your time. I, uh